The profit's reward is a truth that has often been exploited for personal gain, while the truth about honoring the least is conveniently ignored. When we honor the least, we honor Christ. Would doing so bring any less of a reward than honoring a prophet? Is the prophet greater than Christ? This message addresses common fallacies concerning the prophet's reward and takes us to what the Lord Jesus really called us to do in honoring one another. This morning, uh, there's another area that we want to address. Uh, it, it, it may think like I am trying to state the obvious, but we have uh, seen people getting hurt in this area. And uh, so we really want to speak about it in church. Um, and, uh, you know, as recent as a few months ago, uh, there was a situation in one of our locations. And, and, uh, and so as pastors, when we reviewed these things, we said, look, we better speak about it in public uh, so that people don't get hurt in, in this area. And so we're doing that this morning. Uh, I'm titling the message, Honor the Least. And you'll Find out a little later on why we've titled it that way, and uh, uh, and we trust that, you know this message, even though it may be very simple or maybe stating the obvious, uh, uh, the the importance of it. We'll start off with Ephesians chapter four, verses eleven and twelve, where Paul the apostle, writing to us the church, he says that Jesus has himself given some to be apostles, some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we believe that in the church today, there are apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. They are functioning in the church today. Now, the apostles of today are different from the, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So in, the, in the New Testament, if you want to, then again, this is just for uh, teaching purposes. We say there are three categories of apostles. There are the apostles, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Uh, entrance to that category is closed. <laughs> there are only 12. <laughs> 12 apostles. They're special. They walked with Jesus. Then there's a second category of apostles. They are what we call as a founding apostles, like Paul and Barnabas and others uh, who were used in the time of the early church to write scripture. Uh, the apostles have brought revelation to us. Again, applications to that category is closed. <laughs> they, they were there. They wrote scripture. But today we have apostles, but they, do not, they belong to a third category. They're not the first, not the second. Today's apostles cannot write scripture. That job is done. Today's apostles are sent once. They are sent by the Lord. Uh, they are pioneers. They, are, uh, they, are, they usually work as pioneers. They are pathfinders. They lead the church into new territory. They over, have oversight over several churches. Uh, they are people who cause movements in the body of Christ and so on. So they're apostolic people. And we recognize the church has apostles today. Same thing with the prophets. Again, there, are, there were Old Testament prophets. Uh, sorry, no one today belongs to that category. That is closed. They are prophets. They were the founding prophets. They're founding apostles and prophets. Again, that is closed. God used those people, again, primarily to give us revelation, to write scripture. That is closed. So today's prophets, they are still the mouthpiece of God, but they are different. It's not, what they say is not scripture. God still speaks through prophets and to his people and through his people, but they are in a different category, but they are there in the church. And so like that, there are pastors and teachers and evangelists in the body. And the reason Jesus has placed these people, five, what we call as fivefold ministers or fivefold functions, it says that in verse 12, he's placed them for the equipping of the saints. That means they're put there, why? So that saints can be Equipped. Saints can be made strong and built up and uh, empowered. So these five ministers are not self-serving. They are there in the church to build up God's people. So that God's people can do the work of the ministry and build up the body of 
Christ. Are you with me? So, we recognize these fivefold ministers. We respect them. We honor them. We've had people come and minister to us and so on. And we recognize these ministers. But unfortunately, uh, in some cases, people in these fivefold ministry functions abuse their function. And the abuse happens primarily in the area of finances. And that's what we want to address here. And uh, bring some understanding here on, the, on how we should handle these things. So unfortunately, this, is, this, this has been going on in the church, in the body of Christ, for quite some time. It's not something new. It's been there for a long time. But then now we'll be finding people being hurt by these things. Sometimes marriages are breaking down because one of the people in the marriage gets trapped by somebody, some fivefold minister, whether an apostle or a prophet or whoever, who's, who's taking money out through that. And the husband is wondering, where is the money gone? And the wife is, wife is happily I'm just speaking an example. It could work the other way also. <laughs> the wife has been happily giving the money off to so-called prophet so-and-so. And, and uh, um, you know, and it, it troubles the family. Now, you and I would think that, hey, hopefully believers had a little bit more uh, discerning or discernment concerning these matters. But unfortunately, we're just finding uh, more and more problems happening. And that's why this morning uh, we are bringing this message. Uh, we are not in any way dishonoring these ministers. Are you with me? What we are doing is let's alert the people of God to some of the abuses are caused by some of these people, not all. Because there are genuine apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. Uh, but in some cases, there are abuses, and then people get hurt, uh, and, and then there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, healing that has to happen, correction, and a lot of work that has to take place because of that abuse. Now, so the point is we must not let preachers exploit us for personal gain. We shouldn't do that. You should have, you and I as believers should have a little bit more uh, discernment, discerning, understanding, uh, and then, you know, we honor people. Now, one of the places where prophetic ministers, again, we are not against the prophetic. We have brought in prophets to minister to us. We encourage all of us in the prophetic. We want all of us to hear from God. We are strongly supporting the prophetic and, and, and believe in that. But, unfortunately, in the church, a lot of abuse has happened through prophetic ministers. So, ministers who uh, speak on behalf of God, bringing prophetic messages. And uh, this is how it happens. So I just want to kind of do a crime scene investigation this morning. And uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. Jesus said, He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's <coughs> reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Now you see, Jesus in Matthew chapter 10 is commissioning the 12 apostles. And he's sending them out to go and represent him and do the ministry, do the work of the ministry. But, and in this, in this passage, he's, he's making these statements. Look, if somebody receives you, it's as good as them receiving me. And if they receive me, they're receiving the Father. To receive means to welcome, be hospitable. It also means to listen to what you have to say. They're receiving you. And then in the same passage, in that same context, he's saying, look, if somebody receives a prophet, because he's a prophet, he will get a prophet's reward. If somebody welcomes and is hospitable to a righteous man, uh, because he's a righteous man, they'll get a righteous man's reward. If somebody receives, gives even a cup of cold water to the least of my disciples, the least, he will get his reward. So he's talking about the apostles. He's talking about the prophets. He's talking about the righteous man. He's talking about the least of the disciples of Jesus. 
So we understand the first part, verse 40, that if you receive, G, uh, receive somebody whom Jesus sent, it's as good as honoring the one who sent him. You're honoring the Lord himself because the Lord sent that person. You're welcoming him because of that. If you receive somebody who is a prophet, because he's a prophet of the Lord, you receive that reward. Now here's where the abuse or the thing, abuse has happened. Prophets have taken this passage and said, look, the reward you get for honoring the prophet is better return on investment than if you honor a righteous man or a disciple. Are you with me? So they present it that way. But that was not what Jesus was saying in these verses. The simplicity of what Jesus was saying is this. If you receive anyone who comes in my name, you will receive a reward from God. Because you honor that person because he belongs to the Lord. If you back up a few verses in that same chapter in Matthew 10. In verses 12 to 13. In that same commissioning, here's what Jesus says. When you go into a household and greet it, you enter a household, you greet it. He's telling his apostles. When you go greet the house, if the household is worthy, let your peace come on it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. So in Bible times, this is what would happen. People go to a house, the apostles would go, and they will greet. They will proclaim peace, meaning shalom. And if the people received them, received the people of God, the Lord's people, that shalom, that pronouncement of blessing would remain on that house. The Lord will make it good. The apostles just proclaim, shalom, we release peace for you. The Lord makes it good in their lives. So in that context, whether whoever it is, an apostle, a prophet, a righteous man, a disciple, a least of the disciples comes to your home, you receive them because they belong to Jesus and they pronounce, Lord, bless this house with your shalom. It doesn't matter who is praying that blessing for you, whether it's an apostle, a prophet, a righteous man, or a little disciple. It is God who's going to release that blessing of shalom for you. Are you with me? It doesn't matter who pronounces it. They are releasing peace. They are releasing shalom for you and you will receive that. God will make it good for you. But here's what has happened in the Christian world worldwide and because it's happening in our own city and some of our own people have been affected, we are addressing it here. What has happened is like I said earlier, prophetic ministers will present this message. The prophet's reward. You will get the prophet's as though that was bigger than if a little insignificant disciple was welcomed into your home with a cup of cold water and that disciple pronounced shalom for you. They will present the prophet's reward as something much bigger. Now most often what happens is they go back to the Old Testament references of Elijah coming to the widow at Zarephath. And, uh, you know, her last meal, they say, you know, she brought her last meal to Elijah. And then what happened? It all started multiplying. And she was so blessed. So bring the last, the least, the, everything you've got, bring it here to the prophet. And sometimes people have done that. Right here in our city. And it's happened around the world as well. They've done that. Because the prophet said, you'll get a prophet's reward. Bring everything. Put everything. And they promise you that things will multiply. And, you know, as in the case of the widow at Zarephath and the woman, the Elisha going to the Shunammite widow, giving her a son and raising her son up back to life. Both these kids, they will promise you that what's dead in your life will come back to life. Things will multiply and so on. That's the prophet's reward. So you want that. Bring what you've got. The last bit. Bring it here. Are you understanding? And this has happened. Families have gotten hurt because of that. But you and I must understand a few things from scripture. You see, you and I, we are not against honoring 
God's people, honoring God's ministers. We're not against it, but we don't want you to be exploited. Are you with me? Don't want you to be exploited. The truth is, while we must honor true servants of God, we must also not forget to honor the least of his disciples equally. And there is no difference in the reward you get. Old Testament has to be understood and applied to the lens of the New Testament. Revelation is progressive. You don't take an Old Testament scripture and just directly apply it to the believer. You've got to look at the Old Testament to the lens of the New Testament. Because what has happened after that? What has happened? What did Jesus say in Matthew eleven eleven? He said, I surely I say to you, among those born of women, there is not one risen greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Think about it. The least person in the kingdom is greater than the greatest Old Testament prophet. Now just imagine if Moses walked in. Prophet Moses. What would your reaction be? Moses, where's the rod? <laughs> how did you part the Red Sea? Moses, how did manna come from heaven? I mean, we would be excited. But you know, Jesus saying, the least one amongst us is greater than Moses. That's what Jesus said. The least in the kingdom is greater than the Old Testament prophet. So, I'm not against honoring Moses. <laughs> but don't forget the least one in the kingdom. Don't forget that the least one in God's kingdom is greater than the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Or Jesus put it like this in Matthew 25. And in verse 40, he said, you know, he's talking about the judgment day when he'll separate the sheep from the goats. And Jesus will say, I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was in prison, you visited me. And they will say, Lord, when did we do all this? And in verse 40, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. When you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. But somehow we've forgotten this. And the church gets so fascinated. You know, when, when you see this prophet come and he does all this one, you know, amazing things. Oh, I'll give him money. But you see the least person sitting next to you probably is going through some challenge. You don't think about, should I not help him or her? Jesus said, when you do it to the least, you're doing it to the Lord. I'm not against honoring the prophet, but don't forget the balance. Amen. Or when you look at the writings of the Apostle Paul, I'm just giving this as an illustration. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, he's collecting an offering from them to give to the saints in Jerusalem. So these are saints who are going through a tough time. They're poor. Uh, there's famine in Jerusalem. So he's collecting an offering from Corinthians. He's giving it to the saints in Jerusalem. In Philippians, he himself is receiving an offering. The people at Philippi have sent an offering to the Apostle Paul. In both instances, his response is the same. His response is, in Corinthians he says, God will make all grace abound to a Jew. To the Philippians he says, my God will supply all your needs. Meaning, whether you give to the least of the saints or the greatest of the apostles, God is the source of your supply. Same God is going to honor you. Are you with me? So don't be uh, 
deceived in thinking that if I uh, give to the apostle, I'll get a greater reward. If I give to one of these insig- least of the disciples, my reward will be small. That's not true. It is God who is going to bless you for your generosity. In both cases, it's the same. You do as God leads you. Now, we know we must honor God's servants. And just to let you, you know, just bring your attention to some scriptures here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, 11 and 14, we know. It says, if you sown, to, sown spiritual things, is it a great thing we reap from you in material things? You can give, you return uh, their service to you in spiritual things with material things. Verse 14, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel live from the gospel. Galatians 6, 6, he was taught in the word. Let him share good things with him who teaches. Or 1 Timothy 5, 17, that the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. So we know it. The Bible teaches us to honor uh, the ministers of God. That's fine. But here's another error I want us to avoid. Many apostolic and prophetic ministers, I'm not saying all, but I'm saying, let me put it like this, not many, but some, would say these, say, make statements like this, if you sow into my anointing, you will receive my anointing, you'll receive my grace. You give money, my grace, my anointing will come on you. Hey, who doesn't want anointing? But they say you sow financially into my anointing. Now one of the passages I often use is Philippians 1, verse 5 5 and 7, where uh, Paul writes to the Philippians and says, you know, you have been partners with me in, in the ministry. You're partnered with me in the grace that God has given me. So they use that, but really what Paul is saying is you've partnered with me in the work that I'm doing as an apostle because of the grace of God given to me. And that is true. They've gave, given to his ministry, helped him do what God had graced his life to do. But he's not promising that because you gave money to me, my grace will come on you. That's not what he's saying. And remember this. In Acts chapter 8, when Simon, who's just become a new believer, he sees that to the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit is given. Simon says, Peter, how much money do you need? One lakh, two lakhs, five lakhs. Give me this power that on whomever I lay hands, they will also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What does Peter do? Peter rebukes him. He says, your money perish with you. Because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. I want us to understand the gifts of God, the spirit of God, the work of God's spirit cannot be purchased with money. It's a free gift by grace. You cannot buy the anointing. So when people say, Sow into my anointing and you will get some of it. It's a big lie. The things of God cannot be purchased with money. You can receive it by grace. But you cannot buy it with money. So we had one instance where somebody gave huge money to the prophet thinking... The prophet's anointing will come on her. And so she self-proclaimed herself as a prophet. (laughs) She wanted to bless one of our associate pastors. (laughs) I mean, you cannot buy the anointing with money. So, what I want to impress on our hearts is this. You and I should have discernment. And I just close with these verses here. And Paul writes, uh, he clearly states the requirement for ministers of God. In 1 Timothy 3.3, he says, you know, women of, men of God or those who want spiritual leaders, they must not be given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. 1 Peter 5 verse 2, Peter is writing to the elders, spiritual leaders, and he says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, 
but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. I mean, don't do it for dishonest gain. And we've seen in this work of the Spirit, all kinds of ridiculous things happen. You know, prophet saying, you give me uh, so much money, I will give you a personal prophecy. It's happening. You bring so much money and you will receive deliverance. I've had people from other churches come and sit with me and say, how do we get out of this? Right here in our city. How do we get out of it? What can we do with that minister who's doing this? So, be careful. One thing, have discernment and have the courage to say no. Why don't we all do that? Say no. No. Say a little strong. No. <laughs> have the courage to say no. I close with this. We were, Amy and I, when we were living in Chicago, we just moved to Chicago. We were trying to find a church and uh, we had visited this particular church. It had some great named ministers coming, ministering, so we thought we could, uh, maybe that might be the church we should go to. And uh, we went there. And I remember this particular service. We went there and there was this prophetic minister ministering, wonderful, gifted. He sang beautifully. He, uh, he, uh, uh, he preached well. He preached from the same passage I referred to about Elijah and the widow of Zarephath and all of that. And then at the end of his message, he, and some of you have heard the story before, so forgive me for repeating it. <laughs> uh, at the end of his message, he came uh, to this. He said, the Lord is saying, there are five people here who have to give $10,000. Please stand up. And I was sitting right there on the second row. <laughs> Amy was outside, Josh was a little boy, so Amy was taking care of him outside the hall. But I was sitting right there. That moment I decided, God, today I am not giving in the offering. I decided that. So, you know, very grudgingly, three people stood up. Then it came down to, God is saying there are ten people who have to give $5,000. Stand up. Few people stood up. The numbers came down all the way to one dollar. And I was the only one sitting. The whole church was standing. Think about, talk about pressure. <laughs> and he's looking at me and saying, one dollar. And I'm not standing up. Seriously. Because I will not give, I will not be pressured into giving anything. When I give, I give it out of the willingness of my heart. So he looked at me, one dollar. It's not that I didn't have money in my heart, I had the money. But I already decided I'm not giving. Because what he's doing is dishonorable. That is not the way for a minister of God to conduct himself. So after a few vain attempts, he had to close the service. But the point is this. I want you to have the courage to say no. Don't be exploited. Don't be coerced into giving with all of these false promises of a prophet's reward or of uh, anointing coming on your life or all of those things. No. You give because of the willingness of your own heart. As the Lord leads and guides you. Bless the ministers of God. But don't forget to honor the least. Because when you honor the least. We honor Christ. And there is no difference. In the reward we get. Amen. Let's stand to our feet please. We're going to pray and close. Father, we thank you for this time in your presence this morning. I just pray for a release of grace, of wisdom, of the ability to discern, God, that we will not be fooled. That we will not be like children tossed to and fro by 
every kind of doctrine or the deceitfulness of men or the cunning craftiness with which they lie in wait to deceive. Father, we pray that the spirit of truth will enlighten our hearts and minds and that we will walk in truth. We will walk in freedom. We will walk in liberty. Because of the truth. I pray that even in this place. Let the Holy Spirit. Bring wisdom into our hearts. Help us Lord to honor the men and women you've placed in the kingdom. To serve the body. To equip the saints. To edify the body. But help us to honor the least as well. Equally. To care for that little disciple who needs a helping hand. That little disciple who, who's, who may not have a name or a fame. But yet, when we do that, we're doing it unto Jesus. Help us to honor the least. We thank you, Father. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.